Hi, I'm Mark Campbell, and I was uh, recently hired at Central State University, and uh, my background is in corn genetics and breeding. Uh, I recently retired from uh, my university in northern Missouri, and I was looking for a place to continue doing my corn breeding and genet genetics work, and Central State was a good place for me to do it. So, I am working in a breeding nursery, and I've got about five acres here of material that's the result of by about 20 years of work that I've been doing and trying to continue work, doing work, developing specialty starch corns and other kinds of corn that have nutritional benefits to them and mainly to try to increase the amount of genetic diversity in, in maize, in corn. Uh, important commodity crop which people have realized there has not been very much uh, genetic diversity as of recently. Well it has an altered starch. Um, the carbohydrate fraction of the starch uh, has been selected so that it does not digest nearly as quickly as normal cereal starches. Corn, wheat, rice, all have a starch that breaks down into sugar fairly quickly. And people have been concerned about this for years, especially in the past few decades where people have been trying to address obesity and diabetes that's been increasing in the United States and throughout the world. And by trying to make the starch resist digestion a little bit more, it, you, you lower the glycemic index so you can avoid having high sugar spikes in your blood system shortly after you consume a, a, a cereal based food. This is all, it's, it's done with a number of genes that are naturally occurring. Um, the, the gene that I found was among many different tropical races of of corn that I have worked with. It was, it was a, um, basically an heirloom variety that was grown down in uh, Guatemala. And it was among many tropical varieties that I work with, but, but this one had a gene sitting in it that when you combine it with some other genes that have already been studied, result in this kind of corn that has a um, a very low glycemic index. So it's got application in foods and also in non-food um, uses like um, corrug corrugated cardboard is uh, uses an adhesive that's based on this kind of starch. And um, uh, biodegradable plastics, people are continuing to study them and improve uh, the functionality of these things so that they're acceptable to consumers. If you were to produce it for commercial production, it would be very similar to um, normal corn. Uh, it has a distinct appearance to it that you, you, can, you can tell it from normal corn. It's got a little bit more of a shinier color to it. Um, but, but other than that, it's, it's, it's a crop that provided that there, there's markets for it, and you can identify um, um, an infrastructure to <clears throat> move it to the end user. Um, this is an excellent place to explore looking at using it and growing it. Well, the, the, the ear was it's a source of grain that would um, be then processed in order to make raw material for a, a variety of applications for food and industrial applications. And people are constantly finding new um, uses of it. And people are finding new kinds of starches too, um, things that are completely natural, but we only now have the resources to be able to, <clears throat> to, to find these. And in my case, one of the resources that I have is for the past 25 years, I have been a public cooperator with a USDA program, um, the USDA National Plant Germplasm System, 
is responsible for maintaining the diversity of many different crops, not just corn, but um, you find <clears throat> there's a seed bank in Fort Collins, Colorado, and that's the United States' largest gene bank for, for crops. Uh, internationally, there's a number of seed banks. Um, probably the most famous is the uh, gene bank in Svel Svelbar, um, Norway, where uh, the international cooperation in trying to preserve the seed in a cold area so you don't have to have freezers there. It just is, people call it the Noah's Ark of, of, of diversity. And, and, I, and I work with uh, USDA scientists. Um, there's a, in the, in, within the National Plant Germplasm System, there, there is a, a, a program. And it's, it's called the Germplasm Enhancement of Maize Project, or GEM, J-E-M. And this, this, this program, it's basically it's a collaborative effort between USDA scientists, um, scientists in the, in the public sector, and scientists in the private sector. And they work together and share information as much as they are able to um, in order to take a large collection of corn, in, in our case, which is 15,000 um, accessions, maybe more, and they systematically evaluated them to find the best performing 200. And then from that, they kept on narrowing down this set to about 50 that showed promise in increasing genetic, the genetic base of corn in the United States. And it's in the pipeline with many comp companies. Um, what exactly they are, they don't have to share everything, but they do share some germplasm in order to take some of this tropical material and get it so it's more adapted to the Midwest. Um, so a considerable amount of time and effort from the public sector has gone into creating this basically open access material that I could take and then select for a particular trait. And the payoff of doing something like that is really making a good argument for our country or any country to invest in plant genetic resources. Because if you can come up with a product that has economic value from this diversity that's being warehoused in Fort Collins, it makes a more compelling argument that we need to be making sure that we fund these uh, these facilities. I always, I always tell people, my job is to create the material and involve other people in evaluating it. I try not to make any claims about it. I know where the interest is, and I know what I have as far as genetic diversity. I, I, I uh, in the GEM program, uh, <clears throat> they avoid using transgenes. They avoid using GMOs, just because they don't want to deal with the legality of it. And the main purpose of it is to look at the diversity, the natural native diversity that's out there. So what I have at this point, um, it, it's it's non-GMO. It's it's all natural. These are naturally occurring genes that just have, through uh, conventional breeding that people have been doing oh, since well, n there's records of Native Americans <clears throat> having done hand pollinations using deerskin bags. I I think um, I read somewhere. There there's some concern that. A lot of the genetics is in the hands of a few companies, and there's there's concern about not really having a lot of choice. Um, as far as GMOs go, there's a place for it, I believe. That's it's a personal thing, but this kind of work can be picked up 
and a, and a company could integrate a transgene in it if they would like to, or if they wanted to make a non-GMO. This is, this is wonderful building material for a program designed at uh, creating a non-GMO, if, if that's the target audience that you'll be marketing to. So everyone benefits, and, this, and the GEM program has released lines that do exactly that, have increased resistance to corn borer and, um, um, and, and also just having the diversity that's near a stage where you can pull it in to start looking at the commercialization of it. Um, it allows us to react more quickly to a, a plant disease like the Irish potato, for example, in Ireland, where you had a million people die and a million people immigrate to the United States. Um, we, that, that could still happen. Well, you can uh, contact me at uh, mcampbell at centralstate.edu. And uh, it's probably the best way to get a hold of me right now. And yeah, I would be glad to share this. I think it's a, a good program. I'm glad to be able to continue it. And it's an honor to be here.